broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, hello, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, welcome to our first ACNC webinar for 2021, in which we're going to explore some of the things that charities it should be doing right now um, in a bid to get their year started out on the right foot. My name's Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me today is Matt Crichton. Hi, Matt. Hello. Hello, everyone. Quickly before we start, as always, just some housekeeping points. Um, if you've got some issues uh, with the webinar audio, you can have a go at listening through your phone. Um, to do that, call the number listed in the email you have received when you signed up to this webinar, put in the access code uh, and listen to the webinar that way. Um, you can type a question at any time throughout the webinar. We've got Bree and Gulnar helping us out and responding to questions that come in. We'll try and answer as many uh, as we can that come through and as they come through. But if your question isn't answered, um, please feel free to send us an email and we'll get back in touch with you. That can be to um, education at acnc.gov.au. We're recording this webinar as well. Um, the recording and the presentation slides will be published on the ACNC website uh, within the coming day or so. Uh, and we'll also send out an email with website links featured in this webinar, uh, so you don't have to write everything down. Um, there's also a handout with a number of those links um, that you'll have received as well and have access to already. Um, finally, as always, we, we value your feedback. So if you've got any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, let us know through the short survey at the end of today's proceedings. Alrighty, preliminaries done. What are we going to cover today, Matt? You know, we can have a look at the, um, the dot points there on the screen. We'll show our plan for today's webinar. Um, as it's the title of the webinar suggests, we are going to go through some of the ways that charities can begin 2021 on the right foot. Um, set themselves up for a good year because, as we all know, last year was was a bit of a tough one, uh, of course, and um, some of the challenges that many charities face will have spilled over into 2021. Um, so we hope today's webinar will provide a, a good overview of some of the things a charity can do to make sure it is uh, heading in the right direction, I suppose. Um, we'll have a look at some ACNC obligations, lessons from 2020, and I suppose how to harness them to, to improve on 2020 and, and make 2021 a success. Uh, your charity's people, policies and, and governance. We'll look at funding and fundraising and then um, and we'll touch on uh, collaboration as, as the final bit. Of course, some of the things we will mention today will be discussed in, in direct relation to what happened in 2020 with, with the pandemic and all the, all the challenges that came from that. That's to be expected. Um, but there will also be some things we'll talk about today that that will be relevant for for all times and, and not you know simply in, in response to, to last year's challenges and they will be worth remembering no matter what the context. Okay, Definitely. back to you to have a look at the first one. Um, good place to start uh, when we when we have a look at uh, some of the bits and pieces is is I guess a quick little uh, reminder of um, some of the obligations charities have to the ACNC um, particularly when it comes to to reporting many charities will have had a January 31 date circled in their calendar as the date by which they had to submit their annual information statements so that's for charities operating on a standard financial year July 1 to June 30. Um, January 31 was the deadline for those annual information statements. Um, if you got there, done it and, and got it completed by that due date, thank you very much. Great work. Um, well done. Um, there are some other bits and pieces and other charities looking to complete their ALSs in the very near future, isn't there, Matt? Yeah, and if you are part of a charity that ha has to do this pretty soon, um, th there are just a few things not only do the AIS, but um, as it says on the slide here, interact with the ACNC through the charity portal for whatever reason. There are a few important things uh, to remember. Um, I'll let you go through these. That's all right. Um, the first one is, as it says there, is your charity's address for service up to date? Um, now, address for service again, that's the address through which we, the ACNC, contact your charity. It's usually an email. 
vital that's correct because obviously if that's not correct we can't get in touch with you with all the important bits and pieces that we may know to need to get in touch with you about are your responsible people they're the people who are as it suggests responsible for the direction and the governance of your charity and board or committee trustees uh, are they listed correctly in the charity portal now i guess it's not uncommon for charities to make changes at their agm for example even early in the new year when there might have been some people arrive some some people leave um, it's important to make sure that those details are up to date um, so uh, that's a, a, a good sort of starting point there for your charity um, and as it says here there's a there's a question about whether the right people can access the charity charity portal if you need help logging into the portal there's plenty of support on the ACNC website um, go to acnc.gov.au forward slash charity portal like that can uh, help you out there um, just on the portal too if you had some changes occur in the last little while people coming or going on new responsible people it's a good time to review who has access to the portal as it suggests here who needs access and also who no longer needs access maybe put this on the agenda in next meeting to discuss and act on um, or simply take action if you already know know what these changes might be uh, remember that the people who need to access the portal uh, should also use their own email address uh, and not a generic one used by others or else there can be some confusion and bits and pieces when it comes to logging in and logging out so um, but that's one to discuss early in the new year I suppose just quickly those first two points too although it, it makes sense from an administrative point of view within your charity to have those things up to date they are actually also requirements of registration with the ACNC to to update them so if they have changed there is, there is a requirement to notify the ACNC of changes to the address for service and to any of the responsible people um, listed with the charity so yes while it's great as a, as a piece of um, administrative work that will help you um, manage your charity operations it, it is also a, re a requirement of the um, of registration with the ACNC to do so. Now, um, we'll get on to the annual information statement because that's um, of obligations to the ACNC. It's probably the most pressing for most people at this stage. A um, couple of things that charities should remember if they are to submit one soon. Visit the ACNC's program preview. Now, this is relevant because there's a new section in the annual information statement that asks charities to provide details about their programs, the work that they do. Um, it may be unfamiliar to uh, people, given that it's new. So we've set up a, a sort of practice one, <laughs> a practice section on the website that you can use to, as it says here, draft your responses um, and put in um, the types of programs you you have and, and have a look at the types of categories that are available um, for you to categorise each of the programs. Um, our webinar from last year actually, if you go to our webinars page on the website, looks at this section in detail. So if you wanted some more assistance there, you can have um, a quick look at that recording. And just make sure the category, uh, sorry, the programs you put in are an accurate reflection of your charity's work at the moment. Eventually these details will be published on the charity register and it's a way for people to be able to find your charity. If someone's looking for a charity that does such and such a program they'll be able to look for that on the charity register and that result that that presence on the charity register will come up based on the information that you put in to the annual information statement so it really is worth having a think about this what are the sorts of things what are the programs you want to show up for your charity on the charity register that can then be used by the public you know potential supporters potential donors um, in searching for a charity that they want to support. So if you think about it in that way, it, it is a pretty important one to, to get right and, and make sure you're putting forth the, the right information. Oh, that was the, the um, Yeah, make sure your charity is right. recorded. <laughs> the, um, there's a, uh, there's a, I guess, a, a, a look at um, noting any changes perhaps to your charity size as well uh, and how they might affect um, your charity's reporting obligations. Um, one one um, thing to think about here uh, is, is obviously JobKeeper. If, if um, 
there's been some some benefits received there or whether that's affected your charity size um, when you're going through your annual information statement and doing a reporting uh, please sort of ensure that, that you know that if you've gone from small to medium sized charity for example uh, make sure that's accurately noted and recorded um, on your on your annual information statement um, again your charity may have been lucky enough to have an increase in revenue for example uh, and it's again crossed that threshold from say small to medium charity or even medium to large charity um, make sure that you note it but also what happens too is this can alter the reporting obligations that you have um, including the need to submit maybe more detailed or more uh, I guess audited um, financial reports so if this is the case for your charity r remember that the ACNC um, allows also to to have charities keep their current charity size for a one-off increase in, in revenue. Um, so if the increase in revenue is temporary uh, and, and not ongoing, um, you can go to, uh, again, our website, uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash charity size um, for more information uh, on that sort of stuff. Yep. And, while, and while we are talking about finances there, financial reporting, um, that, so just got some new information on, on the uh, website that covers many of the things you'll need to know about reporting to the ACNC through the annual information statement and the financial information that you'll have to provide. So have a look at that. We've got the link there. That will also be in the handout that you've got and the follow-up email that we send after this. But just on on JobKeeper, keep in mind that as we speak, it is scheduled to wrap up in uh, March. But keep your eyes on any news for updates on this. And ch changes to JobKeeper, of course, may mean changes to a charity's income. So one task to keep in mind as we get through February is whether your charity has made any projections based on the ongoing receipt of uh, JobKeeper payments. And something worth considering. D just be cautious on it, of course, as well. The basics apply. Don't overcommit based on income you may not receive and, and factor in you know, possible losses of of those sorts of payments in any forward thinking as you get through the first half of this year. Of course, this is largely common sense, I suppose, and most charities already consider these factors when forecasting, but it is worth mentioning. Chris, um, oh, I was, sorry, <laughs> I beat you to it, Matt, sorry. Um, there's, we've looked at some of those ACNC related details and information statement related details. Um, there are, of course, some other things that you can do to help your charity get its 2021 sort of off on the right foot. And one here, as suggested on the screen, is bringing some of your lessons from last year into this year. Now, I, I guess for, for many reasons, 2020 was a challenging year. Um, we all know the drill, we all know the story there. Um, charities, had to make changes as, as well in what they did and, and how they went about what they did. Um, think about perhaps some of the things your charity was forced to do and, and the ways that it um, had to adapt. Um, have, a, have a bit of a think about that. Um, and I guess ask yourselves, what did you learn from, from 2020? What things did you do in 2020 that, that worked, that perhaps helped your charity, that proved to be beneficial to its operations. Um, look, it, it might be something as simple as the um, much the much parodied uh, idea of remote meetings. Um, many organisations were thrust into having to stage remote meetings as a norm uh, rather than meeting in person um, and or perhaps even to rem meet remotely more often than what they would have done normally in person. Um, it proved to be a bit of a mixed bag uh, for some uh, charities, for some organisations overall, worked well. For others, it may not have. Um, so that's just one example, obviously, um, and, and it may shape the way your charity chooses to do things in the future. Um, as the effects of COVID pandemic hopefully decrease, um, taking advantage of some of the benefits offered by our adventures perhaps into things like remote work um, will be important. Um, another might be the way that your charity planned its work, um, carried out its financial projections or, or monitored projects even. Um, did your charity need to put your focus on a more short-term basis when carrying out some of these tasks last year? 
um, did you seek out more detailed feedback, um, set in place perhaps better planning um, or different planning, um, allocated resources differently? Um, in doing so, what proved to be beneficial uh, and, and what proved to be worth perhaps carrying with you. Um, if something worked for your charity last year, put it in your tool bag um, and take it with you into this year. Don't be afraid of taking some of the positive things with you as you step forward into the new year um, and be open-minded about it, be adaptable uh, about it as well. Um, take the lessons that you learned and, and take them forward with you. Um, just because some of the, the restrictions that we have had in, in recent times have, have lifted uh, and have altered. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to do away with some of the, the new ways, the innovative ways, the different ways that you've managed to get through some of these difficult times. So take on board perhaps what, what worked and what, and what um, did the right thing by your charity and, and bring it with you into 2021. Yeah, for sure. Em embrace the stuff that worked because it's forced a change in behaviour. And if that forced change of behaviour has worked out to be something good or beneficial, that, that's that's the silver lining in all of this, I suppose. You can take it into the next year and beyond the pandemic to improve um, your charity's operations. And on the flip side of this coin, I'll, I will move over this slide actually on time, not like the last one that I left the previous one up for way too long. Um, let's be honest about what didn't work in uh, 2020. Again, maybe the remote meetings were was just simply not effective for what it is that you do or what it is that your your charity needs. So make the make the change in focus on certain tasks and, and charity efforts. Um, Maybe it made, turned it into more micromanaging and that didn't really work. So a good step in 2021 is to decide which um, which ones are worth leaving in the past, which ones are worth leaving as lessons from, from the strange year of 2020 and, and not doing anymore. Adjust your charity's work processes to reflect the new ways we've done things and, and use our there's a new found familiarity to find permanent improvements to your charity's operations. So so last year worked as a, as a good unexpected but but nonetheless a, a good experiment in new new ways of working to figure out um, how to do things that you wouldn't have ordinarily had the chance to do so it's worth um, keeping that in mind so discuss what didn't work with your charity board and, and senior management or everyone depends on how big or small your charity is and um, make that um, part of your plans for for 2021 and beyond now for, I guess, a lot of the past 12 months, many charities, many organisations ended up a little bit more fixated on what was immediately in front of them. Um, you head down, bum up, uh, eyes and focus on, on short term tasks and entirely understandable, uh, entirely understandable too. Um, but an important thing to keep in mind as we move now into 2021 is for your charity and, and your people to remember how to, I guess, look up. Um, have the ability to change your focus, avert your gaze and, and do so from what's right in front of you and what's right in front of your faces to look at perhaps your charity's wider uh, operating context, I guess, in a way. Yep, many charities will have come to terms with lots of new ways of operating and, and will have had to deal with significant changes, the not least of which to do with funding. So now may be the time to consider the charity's longer term, as well as getting through the everyday. Whereas 2020 really put the everyday for a large chunk of the year in the forefront of everyone's minds. I suppose the the relative easing of the challenges from the pandemic and and a bit of the, a lull in in what we had to deal with last year has has arrived so it's a chance to set the sights a little bit higher again. Now one way or, or one component of this is is your charity's people, um, it's, it's staff and it's, it's volunteers at, at, at that level. Um, for many people like obviously again it's been a challenging time, your, your charity should regularly check in with volunteers and staff during difficult times um, or, or I guess any time, uh, really. Um, 
some things to, to think about here. You ask, how, how are your charities people? How are your people? Um, have their challenges, the cha their own challenges, um, left them, I guess, less able or unable to support your charity in the way that they may have done so in the past or resulted in them maybe only being able to support your charity in, in different ways or in, or in more limited ways. Um, if that's the case, what effect will this have on your charity? Um, how will it work with these changed circumstances? Are there people, for example, who might not be able to contribute in person, but could contribute virtually? Are there fewer volunteers able to help with fundraisers, for example? Uh, and again, we're going to have a look at that topic uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes as well. Yeah, so how, how can your charity best work with its volunteers in 2021? We had to make a bunch of changes in 2020 and some of those will have affected different charities in, in different ways. But it's worth thinking about the charity's plans for the next six to 12 months and thinking whether or not your volunteers fit into those plans in the same way that they did prior to everything being disrupted in 2020. Of course, lots of us would love to just rewind the clock and go back to how it was and how it was working comfortably and, and in a familiar way before the pandemic hit in 2020. But it may be that the changes to the charity circumstances means that we can't just um, pick up what was working in 2019 and, and plonk it into 2021. So think about how your charity can best work with its volunteers, how the volunteers will fit into the charity's plans given the disruption of 2020. And speaking with the charities board and, and the people in charge of making decisions in making that work, have a look at our resources there, acnc.gov.au forward slash engaging volunteers for some tips on, on doing that. Now on, on the charities people, it may be that your charity has lost staff or volunteers. Maybe that was forced on you. Maybe it was a decision of the volunteers and the staff themselves, given what happened last year. But it, there are some important questions to think about for 2021. Uh, what's it going to mean for your charity? Are you going to have to recruit new volunteers? If so, how many and, and to do what? Is there a need for specialist knowledge or experience in recruiting staff volunteers? Are you going to have to shift responsibility for some roles from staff to volunteers? And again, this will be different for different charities depending on your work, but it is a consideration for, for many. How are any changes in the staff volunteer levels going to affect the charity's work? Will there be a change in programs? Will there be uh, maybe a scaling back on plans that were set um, a little while ago. You may have to re-examine the programs that, that are relying on staff or volunteers or, or you know, certain expertise. But on the flip side, also you could expand ones that were able to succeed given the remote working challenges. And again, just on JobKeeper, that is ending soon. So how is that going to affect how many staff members your charity can realistically uh, afford to keep on? Um, now some, some other things can, to consider, there's if you've gained, if your charity's gained or, or lost some staff or some volunteers, um, it's probably a good idea and a, and a good time to have a think about whether there are particular skills or abilities or, or knowledge gaps that you, your charity has now that you will have to try and either fill or, or cater for. Um, do you need to look at um, induction? Uh, or training for new volunteers or, or staff that you are bringing on board to perhaps fill some of these skills and knowledge gap, gaps or to uh, take take over a little bit from others who may not be able to uh, help you as they've done in the past. Um, are your volunteer related policies uh, you know, and induction policies up to the mark um, or do they need a little tweak? Do they need some updating? Do your staff or volunteers need other support to continue to support you and continue to help you. Can you provide it? Uh, or do you know others who might be able to do so? Um, there are clearly a lot of things to think about when it comes to your people, uh, be they volunteers or, or staff. Um, how can your charity help people dealing with their own difficulties? Does your charity have the support available to know maybe where to direct people that need support 
Um, there are many charities and other organisations that offer great services to people who are struggling, um, clearly. If your charity can't manage this sort of thing, this sort of support on its own, um, and look, let's face it, it's, it is probably a, a bit of a challenge. Um, it's a good idea to make sure that you know where to direct people um, and, and uh, where you can uh, where you can send them or refer them so that they can get some some help. Uh, a good way to start the year is to again examine your charity situation and set in place processes to address any relevant issues. It might be developing or updating policies, it might be recruitment and induction requirements, it might be engaging more closely with your staff or, and volunteers. Um, and, and one more thing, and we we, we say this a bit, um, talk to your people, talk to your volunteers, talk to your, your staff, chat with them, um, ask them questions about where they're at perhaps, what might be impacting on them um, as, as volunteers or as staff. Be, be engaged with them, sit down with them, understand what they might need, um, understand perhaps there might be even very small things that your charity can do to keep them involved and engaged um, as a, a mutually beneficial relationship in that way. Ensure you have, a, I guess, a dialogue with them and take the time to listen, to, to, um, to chat and take on board maybe the feedback they might have about their role. Um, that's important. That's important as we move forward. Yeah, and people are the lifeblood of the charities, as these um, quotes here suggest, so make sure that you keep that at the forefront of the decisions you make in 2021 and, and beyond. Now we'll move on to some issues with, well, some things to do for policies and governance, Chris. Yeah, we we um, we at the ACNC when we we talk about policies um, emphasise the importance of policies need to be living documents. Um, they can't just sit in a filing cabinet or on a hard drive or a memory stick, um, gathering actual or virtual dust, um, not well known, maybe unseen. They need to be relevant. They need to be appropriate, and they need to be fit for purpose. Um, and this is particularly the case uh, as we waltz into 2021. Yeah, and, and, a, and a common recommendation is that charities review internal policies and procedures or, or processes every 18 months to two years. But some charities might want to do this a little bit more frequently, of course, given their particular circumstances. During 2020, your charity may have found itself looking at its policies and wondering whether they were fit for purpose and, and appropriate given the challenges that you were faced with with very little notice. And of course, 2020 um, provided a unique set of circumstances for many charities. So perhaps it wasn't the best context in which to judge you know, long-term suitability for policies, but nonetheless, it did provide, sort of acted as a catalyst for action on reviewing policies and at least having a look at them and becoming familiar with what they did state um, for your for your staff and, and volunteers. And having had a look at them, um, it is important to ha have a think about which or in which ways they can be updated, they can be made more relevant for the current circumstances given the lessons of 2020 and how they can, I suppose, affect a more sustainable um, a sustainable way in the in the medium to long term, and some of them may yeah. work, and some of them may need some rewriting or so it's just some updating. And so, some of the ones, some of the policies that might need a review. Uh, and of course, this depends uh, on your charity circumstances. Um, but some of them that might need a review, some of them might, might more commonly need a review or a bit of a, a look over. Um, Include as we've mentioned just previously, policies and procedures relating to your to your volunteers, um, the risk management policies and procedures that you may have. Um, 2020 might have been a, a a real good test for for some risk management policies. Um, did they did they stand up? Did they do the job? Or was there something that you you sort of found that just didn't seem to work or wasn't practical uh, and that could be improved and and that could be altered. Um, so have a have a bit of a critical look and a critical think at that. Um, handover policies and, and procedures. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
look, it, that's, this is especially sort of relevant if there's been a turnover of people at your charity um, or if you've had people who are changing roles um, in your charity as we exit one year and, and enter 2021. Um, another one might be, I guess, um, working conditions, remote working, which we've also touched on. Um, if you've got policies in relation to some of these these issues, um, remote working, remote even remote sort of board meetings, uh, acting as a responsible person remotely, those sorts of things. How does this all work? How does this fit? What, um, what about perhaps if you've got staff um, leave or flexibility for people working from home? Um, will your charity offer you know, remote work uh, or remote meetings or that sort of stuff on a permanent or even semi-permanent basis? Um, how do your policies support this? So again, another opportunity to have a look at these sorts of things. Another one is the conflict of interest policy. Um, conflicts of interest uh, related party transactions, they are still among the most common issues that charities uh, contact the ACNC about. Um, we've got some great uh, resources there at um, I'll say forward slash conflicts of interest or conflict of interest, sorry. Um, so go and have a look at those as well. Um, one other one is your fundraising policy. Uh, might well have been sort of looked at or reviewed in the last 12 months, uh, but if not, your charity should perhaps consider giving it a bit of a look over, given the ever-changing fundraising landscape um, and the challenges that are, are, have been experienced. Um, we have some policy templates. Um, you can see the link there on your screen. Um, we've also got some other useful templates, same, same address there. Um, there are also some other sites and other places around um, the lovely World Wide Web where you can um, get some of uh, this sort of information, some templates and some policy ideas and that sort of stuff. Our community is one one place, uh, NFP Law is, is another um, and we've got those links in the handout and if they are not, they will also be in the uh, email that will get sent out after this meeting. It also may be yeah, a good time to review charity governance processes as well. I mean, governance review is just something that gives charities a chance to look at their governance arrangements, I suppose, how meetings are held, uh, the decision-making processes, how effective the board is in doing its work, review is reporting, those sorts of things. And if your charity has undergone some changes, it may have grown, it may have shrunk, or uh, some other people have left, um, change some of its programs, then a governance review can help. It may need to alter the size of the board, for example. Does there need to be better monitoring of a specific program or project, perhaps through a subcommittee or someone specifically overseeing it? Now, charities might uh, set up a meeting of their board or responsible people to carry out a review. But another option is to review policies and documents to see what's required. A charity board or or committee members might be asked to provide feedback, for example, on areas of improvement or things they believe are being done well. And again, we've said it a few times, but as we come out of the challenges of 2020, it might be a really good time to put this to staff and, and the responsible people, the board and the committee, because there will have been many lessons learned and there will have, I suspect there'll be lots of important feedback that have come from uh, the challenges of 2020 and some of that feedback can lead to some really important improvements um, in, in a more permanent sense as we come out of the, the challenges of 2020. Now we've got um, uh, I guess another thing to, to look at here while we're talking reviews um, is your strategic plan. Um, and as we suggest here on the screen, has your charity reviewed its strate strategic plan entering the new year? Um, this is a, a pretty good idea to have a bit of a look at this uh, it's, as a part of getting things going on the right foot in, in 2021. Um, strategic plans sort of at their base level, they, they state your charity's vision uh, or its mission and then they detail what your charity is doing to achieve these things, um, to achieve its mission, to live up to its, its vision. Um, strategic plans often list goals or, or measurables um, that provide some information and, and some important reference points 
that uh, on, on the progress that your charity is making towards its its vision and its its overall mission. Yeah, so so keep the strategic plan in mind and keep reviewing it, looking at it, and making changes, tweaking it according to the changes in the charity's environment, the changes that uh, come that are unexpected as 22 offered, 2020 offered, and then the the changes that you can see coming in the in the short term or in, or medium term. Of course, how did last year affect the strategic plan? Did it change what the charity could do? Did it change the charity's broader mission and aims? Um, have a look at how it how you think it affected what you were planning to do, and then how you think it should um, set the tone for the next six, twelve, or eighteen months. There are again plenty of re reference points on developing and reviewing strategic uh, charity strategic documents available on the web from from both local and overseas sources. And some of the ones Chris mentioned already have some great resources. Our community is a is a, is a good one, full of um, wonderful resources and and not for profit law also. Now we'll have a look at some funding and fundraising issues. Yeah, it goes without saying virtually that that the fundraising landscape changed noticeably in 2020. Uh, and look, to be honest, there's still quite a bit that might be unclear about where things are going to go, uh, even in these early stages of 2021. Um, we, we there are a number of things that that we simply don't know. Um, so we've we were lucky enough. Our our commissioner. Um, uh, Gary Johns uh, was uh, interviewed and featured as part of a recent uh, piece in the Sydney Morning Herald and we've um, included that link in the uh, handout. Um, and as was discussed in that, that piece, there's I guess some level of consensus that the effects of, of, of COVID um, and all the uh, all the bits and pieces that went on last year on charity fundraising had been uneven um, and had been hard to quantify in in a very specific or exact way. Um, some charities experienced shortfalls in some areas of fundraising. Um, they saw an increase in other uh, in other areas. Um, others had expected a large shortfall, perhaps did better than what they expected. Um, uh, as as we noted, or as uh, our commissioner noted, um, uh, Dr. Johns described the effects as a, a very mixed bag across the sector. Um, significantly, though, um, he also indicated there might be a delayed impact for some groups in the charity sector, um, an impact that might not become entirely clear for a little while. Yeah, and smaller charities, charities perhaps, with fewer fewer reserves, um, less to fall back on, less diversity in the fundraising sources that they have. So in that sense, more reliant on say a single source or something like that, and less access to government funded sources are, are probably the ones likely to be affected more. For some, new ways of fundraising may have ended up being a big hit or, or miss compared to what they'd done before virtual events or, or fundraisers, online platforms, that sort of thing. Of course, we saw a big spike in their use in 2020 and the success of which will have varied depending on the purposes of each charity and, and what they got out of their previous fundraising strategies. So as we look into 2021, what can your charity be doing? What, what should it be doing? given the lessons it learned in 2020. So at the start of the webinar, we did talk about, we did talk about that, taking the lessons from 2020 and, and applying them, the good ones, <laughs> for use in 2021. Fundraising is definitely one that falls into this. So if online fundraising worked, running events online, having online campaigns, using social media more so than you would have for things like fundraising, if that worked, it's worth, keeping that and making it part of your ongoing plans in the next in the next little period if it didn't work as expected and of course it's not it's not um the magical way to lots of funding that some people think it is it's not always going to work in the way that we hope 
have a look at the things that didn't work and analyze them to see how you can use them for 2021 and beyond and and make them work in a better way as a i guess as a charity you might well have already reviewed some of your 2020 fundraising efforts and and you might already be clear on what worked um if you are again ensure what worked can actually transfer into 2021 with a decent level of success as well um for for example and, and matt just mentioned um online efforts uh to to fundraise or to attract or gain funding or donations um there's been some interesting recent reports again in the media about how a number of charities uh, in Australia had, had perhaps uh, moved away almost by uh, absolute need from face-to-face -face fundraising during 2020 um, and it shifted a bit more of their focus or a bit more of their, their concentration online and um, had, had targeted I guess social media in a more analytical way in a, in a bid to try and find donors and, and donations um, but if this has been something that you've you've done in in 2020 how can it help in 2021 what part can it play in an overall fundraising strategy in 2021 and you should consider the learning curve involved in doing new things um, although some initial results that you might have had with a new strategy may have been perhaps less than what you could have expected Ask if there's room for improvement. Ask if you have uh, a second or a third go at, at something. Will it do better? Will it? Um, will you get better at managing the new ways of fundraising and, and perhaps seeing benefits coming from them? Yeah, we mentioned face-to-face -face fundraising, and it may be that for some areas, some aspects of the sector, there's an opportunity now to embrace face-to-face -face fundraising again or in some sort of return um, in maybe a diluted version of what was once the norm in 2019 we've seen the return of the ubiquitous bunning sausage sizzle for example in in some recent times that there are other fundraising or funding streams that your charity relied on in the past that are worth discussing for use again in in the coming months that of course isn't going to apply to everyone given that we know there are uh, different levels of restrictions in force across the country in different areas so of course this depends on physically what you're allowed to what you're allowed to do but it is worth considering a comeback of some of the things that you may have relied upon once upon a time as restrictions do ease and we would like to hope in a more in a more permanent way there have been reports that charity shops have noted an upturn in customers in early in 2021 with people coming back as the restrictions ease in certain areas. Also, think about grants and grants programs. Obviously, some charities are in a, a better shape to, to apply for and perhaps receive grants funding than, than others. But grants are a funding stream that should at least be on all charities' radars as a minimum something you can do is sign up for a service like Grants Connect, um, the URL for that, which we will include in the follow-up email, is grants.gov.au. That provides some information on current and upcoming federal government grants opportunities and allows you to search for grants that may be applicable for your charity. So if that's something you haven't considered seriously before, it's worth having a look at. And there are also non-government online uh, grant bulletins that you can sign up for which cover a range of uh, both government and other philanthropic grants and closer to home your local council may have some grants opportunities that could suit your charity so it is worth a call or having a look at what they've got available to uh, see if there's something that applies to the work that your charity is doing in your local community um, and, and what else in this area? Um, donor engagement. Um, charity should be looking to make donor engagement and, and communication a priority, um, obviously to help retain existing donors and to attract new ones. Um, look, get your information again up to date on, on the charity register, uh, fill in the annual information statement, get your programs uh, up there, uh, as we mentioned earlier in this webinar. Um, 
get on the front foot as well and look at how you can diversify your, your funding stream so there are more opportunities that your charity can take advantage of, um, fundraising from different sources, using different methods, different ways, you know, uh, online, face-to-face, -face, that sort of stuff. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket is pretty much the, pretty much the lesson there. Um, if you only draw from two or three sources of fund, fund, uh, funding, uh, have a think. Should you be casting your net a, a little wider? Um, a diverse fundraising sort of, I, I guess, menu um, keeps fundraising balanced and ensures your charity is not just trying to draw everything from one source. Um, and again, uh, referring back to our, our chat where our comments earlier on about policies, um, is your fundraising policy up to date? Is it relevant? Is it a living document? If not, you may need to review it. Um, our fundraising hub, the ACNC fundraising hub, uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash fundraising, has a lot of great information about fundraising, um, as well as links to various state and, uh, and territory organisations as well. We've mentioned our community here, I'll give, give them a quick mention again. They've long talked about something they call the seven pillars of fundraising. Um, as well as the importance of diversity in, uh, in fundraising sources and how this helps charity sustainability. There's some information on their website uh, about that as well. And again, when we mentioned, we mentioned earlier when we were talking about volunteers and staff, um, talk, talk to your donors, talk to those who do fundraising with you or on your behalf, talk with them, ask them questions ask what's affecting them. What do they see going on? What do they see out on, to use a hackneyed phrase, the front line? Um, what's the environment they're seeing with fundraising? Um, and donors, again, take some time to talk with them, understand where they're at, um, and continue to build the relationships and the dialogue there with them. And we'll move on to collaboration now this is the last one we'll cover before we get to some questions uh, collaboration is something that some charities do overlook would collaboration be that with business community groups uh, government um, organ agencies of, at different levels even other charities would that help make help you make the best use of the resources and at the same time help you work, work towards the best outcomes for the beneficiaries um, collaborating, working together can come in a number of forms and it might be as simple as sharing resources or sitting down to discuss ways to address issues that your charity may face that, that it has in common with similar charities, be that um, by virtue of similar work you do or that you're in a similar area geographically you're under you know, certain similar regulatory um, coverage. So have a think about collaborating with different organisations for different purposes. Your charity it could have a discussion about uh, whether there are beneficial opportunities to collaborate with um, others, be, be they large or small entities. And um, But if you're doing so, if you're looking to do so meaningfully, I suppose, that um, you need to have some pretty clear guidelines and policies that support your ventures into, into a collaboration with another organisation. We've got some useful information about collaborating, uh, in particular on corporate partnerships on our website, which will include a link in the follow-up email for you there. There's a, there's a guide, a, a webinar and, and a podcast which uh, covers some of the ins and outs of venturing into a corporate partnership and, and what benefits that can have, but also some of the drawbacks. So it's worth um, paying attention to some of those resources. Um, now, we've got uh, some quick tips. We've, we've covered quite a bit of ground today, obviously. Um, and again, look, obviously every charity is unique um, and covering as wide a sweep of information as, as possible is something that we've endeavoured to do today. Um, but what we hope that we've achieved in doing so is that there's been some useful material, some some great tips, some ideas and some thought starters perhaps for your individual circumstances, your charity's individual circumstances. So to wrap up today, we've got some quick sort of takeaway points, some things to remember. Um, first couple, um, the first one, again, we, we mentioned it, see what worked in 2020, carry it into 2021 if applicable. 
um, take the lessons from last year's challenges and put them in your in your kit bag, uh, good or bad, uh, so that you know what you sh perhaps can pursue and what you might need to avoid. Um, remember your reporting obligations. Um, now that's to the ACNC through the annual information statement, as well as to other regulators. Um, ensure that you have the information required. You're sure you can access the ACNC charity portal. If anything's changed, you need to tell us as well. Um, and ensure you have um, the relevant details that might have changed or updated, actually updated. Remember to think about the people that make up your charity and its work, volunteers, the staff. Have a look at the charity situation. Consider the staff situation, recruitment levels, the work available, the, the need for volunteers, and, and critically assess how that's going to look in 2021. Number four here, are the policies and governance arrangements still in order? What, what did 2020 do to your charity that made you think about the policies that it had been based on and that its work had been based on and, and how are they going to need to change going into 2021 and beyond. And the fifth thing to remember here is, again, what worked in 2020 that you can carry forward and integrate into your, your fundraising in 2021? What did you have to put on the shelf perhaps in 2020 that might be able to make a comeback this year? Remember to seek diversity in your funding sources, uh, endeavour to cast your net wide um, and ensure your fundraising policy is is relevant and is up to date. Um, again, given the context of, of what's occurred over the past uh, 12, 12, 14 months or so. Um, look, we've reached the end of our sort of formal side of our presentation today. Uh, again, just a reminder, we're recording this webinar. So uh, the recording and the presentation slides are gonna be available on our website um, in the coming day or so. Uh, again, an email will be headed uh, the way of everyone who registered with um, some of the links that we've mentioned here, um, as well as the handout that you'll have received as well. Um, now, before we do go, we've, we've gotten a few questions through um, during today's proceedings. Uh, I know some of you took the opportunity to ask a question or two beforehand as well, which was great. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, the first one that, that a couple of people have asked about, um, programs and, and the program previewer and the annual information statement, um, can charities provide a, a program with what's known as a, the same classification, but different beneficiaries, those who it aims to help? Um, what's the go with that one, Matt? Uh, yeah, the, the funny thing about the program section of the annual information statement is that, that it's good to think about it having a little bit of freedom in the way you answer it. So ultimately, the information you put in there is going to show up on the charity register and be searchable from people for people that are using the register to find charities, whether they be potential, you know, supporters, donors looking for charities, looking for services, that they're going to be able to use the charity register to find your charity. And that's largely going to be through the information you put as programs. So having sort of laid that contextual um, groundwork, it depends on how you want the programs um, to come across for, for your charity. So it may be that you do um, put in a, a single program, one of your programs, that lists several beneficiaries. So when the people are searching for certain beneficiaries um, to help with a charity that they want to support, you know, that program will come up. It may be that you put in a program to two sort of slight streams of the same main program that focus on two different beneficiary types because you want those two programs sort of to be, to be presented in, in, two, um, in two different ways. So it, it can be done. You can, you can put in a program that um, covers a, a range of beneficiaries. We like you to be as specific as possible, of course, because ultimately that will be beneficial for your charity if you are specific. And but if you'd like to, you know, split up a, a larger program into its two, three, four streams, then that's another way of presenting the work that your charity does too. And those streams may have specific beneficiary groups that are sort of separate and independent of each other. So 
the short answer is yes, you can do it. And there is that point about there being a, a little bit of leeway and freedom in the way in which you answer it based on how you want that information to come across for your charity. But I will finish that answer with one point about there being a limit on 10. So you can't go and list 400 programs. <laughs> There's a limit on that section of the annual information statement to 10 programs. So have a think about how you're going to present that information to a public in, in future and limit it to, to 10 as a maximum. You have to put in at least one, but the maximum is up to 10. Yeah. We've also been asked um, as a little bit of a follow-up uh, regards the strategic plan, which we mentioned during the webinar. Um, how, how, do you, how do you follow up or how should a charity follow up a strategic plan to, I guess, analyse and look at what worked uh, and perhaps what programs should be run in, in the next plan when it comes time to, to do that? Um, and look, A, this is a good question. Um, and look, these strategic plans, they, they often start with, I guess, a very high level look at, as we mentioned, charity vision and charity mission, um, as well as the work that the charity is going to do to achieve these aims. Um, but an important part of <clears throat> these types of plans, excuse me, is to have some targets and goals for your charity's work that do actually provide a measure on its progress against the strategic aims that have been set out. <clears throat> um, progress on charity goals ought to be measurable. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Your charity should be able to measure how its projects contribute to the overall goals, the overall mission. Um, and they should be able to measure it by outlining clear targets and milestones that they hope will be achieved. Um, these targets might be you know, quantitative, numbers based, that sort of stuff, or they might be qualitative as well. So this means when you sit down to analyse programs and their success, um, you really should have a bit of a pre-built um, idea of the goals, the measurables and the targets that you can use when when you're doing so as, as a guide. Um, now, of course, there might be some times where these goals or measurables can get skewed. Um, we, we've probably seen that in 2020. Um, but this is where ongoing discussions, progress reports on projects and programs, that's where these things come into play. Your charity should be keeping an eye on things throughout the year, uh, monitoring progress, discussing issues, seeing if anything's been skewed. Um, and with all that context and, and monitoring and, and the necessary chats and discussions that go on, your charity is responsible. People, you know, should be able to then more easily, I guess, discuss what programs will be run uh, and how, and do so in, uh, I guess, a more informed manner. So uh, hopefully that helps a little bit, but having measurable goals is a key when it comes to looking at what programs are successful, because you have to measure success against something so having those goals built in to such planning um, is vital. Uh, then you can go back and revisit those goals and see what happened uh, with them. Um, now, 